Hi, and welcome back to my channel, Learning Biology with Dr. Vanessa. In today's video, we are going to be talking about skeletal system physiology. If you've been watching my last few videos, you've noticed that I've been talking a lot about the skeletal system. In the first video, I talked about an introduction to the skeletal system, followed by another video on bone formation, and finally, we're gonna finish up with the physiology of bone in this video. One of the things that we have to remember about bone is that bone is a living tissue. I've mentioned this before, bone gets hardened in its matrix, but even still, bone is a living tissue. That means there are cells in there that are living and need nutrients and create waste. There are blood vessels that um, transverse throughout all of bone, so there are arteries delivering um, oxygen and nutrients to those cells, and there are veins that are going to take um, those wastes away. And obviously those arteries are going to get smaller into arterioles and capillaries, just like they would in any other organ. So bone is a living tissue and bone can also contribute to the physiology of the body. Remember, bone is a hardened matrix and it is made out of both calcium and phosphates. And so we can put those calcium and phosphates into bone to make bone, to harden bone, but we also have the ability to take those out if the body is in need of those. So bone, mature bone, is going to remain a metabolically active organ. It is involved in its own maintenance of growth and remodeling. Uh, in my last video, I talked about bone growth um, and bone formation, and I mentioned that there are certain parts of this that continue throughout your entire life. Bone remodeling is one of those. Um, the bone tissue is also going to be able to exert a profound influence over the rest of the body. And it does this because just as I mentioned before, it is going to be able to exchange minerals um, with tissue fluid, okay, with blood. Those um, minerals are going to be able to be exchanged um, throughout the body. Mineral deposition or mineralization is a crystallation of calcium phosphate as well as other ions from plasma into bone tissue. In this case, collagen fibers become encrusted with minerals that harden the matrix. And this is how bone is formed. As those calcium phosphate and other ions from the blood come into the bone, the collagen fibers can intermingle with these and then this is going to eventually harden that matrix. Remember, the osteoblasts are the ones that are responsible for laying down bone. So they are going to be responsible for laying down this matrix. And as the matrix gets hardened, those osteoblasts are going to become entrapped in the matrix and become osteocytes. Osteocytes are then now responsible for maintaining um, the bone homeostasis. This leads to the question that if calcium phosphate and other ions are found from the blood and come from the blood, then why don't other tissues get calcified? The answer to this is that most tissues have inhibitors that prevent the calcification, whereas bone does not have these inhibitors. As a matter of fact, Osteoblasts are responsible for neutralizing these inhibitors, and they allow the salts to participate within the bone matrix, allowing for the hardened and calcified matrix. Abnormal calcification can sometimes occur in the lungs, brain, eyes, muscles, tendons, or arteries. This is when um, calcification does occur, maybe those inhibitors aren't working properly, or there are just not enough, and calcification, um, calcified deposits can happen. A calculus is a calcified mass that is in an otherwise soft organ, such as the lung. Mineral resorption is the opposite of mineral deposition. Mineral resorption is the process of dissolving the bone and releasing those minerals into the blood. This is performed by the osteoclasts. Remember, the osteoblasts build bone. They were responsible for mineral deposition. 
whereas in mineral reabsorption, we see the work of the osteoclasts at their ruffled border. Remember, the ruffled border is the border that meets the bone matrix. Uh, the osteoclasts are responsible for secreting hydrogen into the space between the osteoclasts and the bone surface, and chloride ions are going to follow by electrical attraction. Together, the hydrogen and the chloride ions are going to form hydrochloric acid. This is going to dissolve the bone minerals. So as the osteoclasts um, move along the surface of the bone matrix and release their hydrogen and the chloride ions follow, this hydrochloric acid with a pH of four is going to dissolve the bone. As the bone dissolves, this is going to release those different minerals um, into the area. Eventually, they would be able to go into the blood. As these minerals go into the blood, they can increase both calcium and phosphate levels within the blood. Now understand that even though osteoclasts are breaking down the bone, they aren't working alone. So meaning there's always a balance between osteoblasts and osteoclasts and their work, and it's going to depend on what the bone needs, what the body needs, etc. So understand that even though the osteoclasts are capable of breaking down the bone to release these minerals so that we can increase these minerals in the blood if needed, they are not going to break down bone so much that you no longer have bone. Uh, osteoblasts are going to be working too. So say there's like a case of you need um, extra minerals in your blood, then the osteoclasts will be working a little bit more to break down bone, but osteoblasts will still be depositing bone just as not such a fast rate to allow those minerals to go into the bloodstream, okay? So osteoblasts and osteoclasts are always working together just at different rates depending on the need of the body and the bone. This idea of mineral resorption and the mineral deposition are going to work together for that bone remodeling we talked about in the last video where the bone is constantly remodeling itself. If you think about braces, right, braces are going to um, help to reposition the teeth and they do so by putting pressures and stresses on the teeth. This allows um, for um, the osteoclast to break down the bone and then the osteoblast to put down more bone um, so that there's not as much stress on those teeth as the braces are going to help reposition those teeth. Now calcium is really important and calcium is a big component of bones. You hear a lot about calcium, drink milk, um, build stronger bones, get that calcium um, in those bones. So calcium and phosphate, even though we talk about them um, in bone structure, they're actually used for a lot more. And this is why it's important that calcium levels and phosphate levels in the blood remain constant because not the bones aren't the only thing that's using this for their matrix. Phosphate is a big component of DNA, RNA, ATP, phospholipids, part of the cell membrane, lots of uh, phospholipids in the cell membranes when we have lots of cells, and also pH buffers. So phosphate is really important. Calcium is needed in neuron communication. That's kind of important when your neurons are talking to each other, allowing you to do what you do, to think, to move. Um, calcium is also involved in muscle contraction, allowing those muscles to contract, blood clotting, and exocytosis. So calcium and phosphate are very much needed to remain in the blood, and the body has to have enough of this in the blood, as well as obviously enough to also contribute to the bone matrix. Um, minerals are deposited in the skeleton, like I had mentioned before, in order to make that bone, and we can also take them out as needed. So the bone is actually playing a huge role in the physiology of the body. There's about 1,100 grams of calcium in the adult body, and 99% of that is found in the skeleton. This is an easily exchangeable calcium ion, and then... Um, 
the calcium ion is much more easily exchangeable, but there is a hydroxyapatite reserve that is in the bone, and this is more stable, a little harder to break down that hydroxyapatite. The hydroxyapatite is made of calcium as well, um, but it is a much more stable reserve that's found within the bones, and so it takes a little bit longer again to break that portion down. 18% of the adult skeleton is exchanged with blood each year. So this is telling you how there is constant work of osteoblasts and osteoclasts within the bone to break it down, build it up, etc. By this point, hopefully you understand that the skeleton, the bones in our skeleton, act as a calcium and phosphate reservoir. Both calcium and phosphate come from the blood, go to the bone where osteoblasts help to put the calcium and phosphate down into the matrix of bone where it becomes hardened and calcified. If the body needs calcium and phosphate, the osteoclasts can release um, their components of hydrogen and chloride, uh, making hydrochloric acid to break down bone and release calcium and phosphate so that it can go back into the blood. So the bone is a big part of the um, body's physiology in that it interacts with the blood to help keep these calcium and phosphate levels stable. So hopefully you understand that there's this interaction, but how does this happen? Okay, how do they know whether to take calcium and phosphate out of the blood because there may be too much or put it back into the blood because there may be too little? And this is where hormones come into play. We're going to talk about a couple of different hormones that are going to work with um, the cells of the bone in order to maintain this physiology. One of them is calcitonin. Calcitonin is secreted by the thyroid gland, and it is secreted by the thyroid gland when calcium levels are too high. What this does in, in overall is that when calcitonin is released, it is going to lower blood calcium concentration. But how does it do this? It does it in two ways. One, it's going to inhibit osteoclasts. Remember, osteoclasts are the cells that break down the bone. When they're actively breaking down the bone, they're releasing both calcium and phosphate into the blood. So if calcium is too high, then it obviously makes sense that this hormone is going to inhibit that osteoclast work. If the osteoclasts are inhibited, meaning they're not breaking down bone as much, then that's going to lessen the amount of calcium and phosphate that's released in the blood. The other thing that calcitonin does is it stimulates osteoblasts. If osteoblasts are working, then they are going to be taking the calcium and phosphate from the blood and putting it down into the bone. So by inhibiting osteoclasts and stimulating osteoblasts, they are going to be taking that calcium and phosphate out of blood and more actively be putting it into the bone matrix, which in turn is going to lower blood calcium. So again, calcitonin is released by the thyroid gland when calcium is too high in the blood and by inhibiting osteoclasts, and stimulating osteoblast, it is going to lower the blood calcium. That is going to be the ultimate goal there, is to lower the blood calcium. What about when calcium levels are too low? When calcium levels are too low, parathyroid hormone is going to be secreted by the parathyroid glands. This hormone is going to raise blood calcium. So again, the stimulus is that blood calcium is too low, then parathyroid hormone will be released, and its ultimate goal is to raise calcium blood levels, and it does so by four different mechanisms. The first one is that it increases the osteoclast population. Remember, osteoclasts, again, are responsible for breaking down the bone and releasing both calcium and phosphate into the blood. So if we increase the osteoclast population, we're going to increase breaking down that bone. We're going to increase calcium levels in the blood. It also promotes calcium reabsorption by the kidneys. 
What this means is that things that are in the kidneys are usually going to be lost in the urine unless they are reabsorbed. So calcium that would be leaving the body as waste is going to be triggered by this parathyroid hormone mechanisms to be reabsorbed by the kidneys, which means bringing it back into the body, bringing it back into the bloodstream, increasing calcium levels within the bloodstream. It is also going to enhance cassitriol synthesis. Keep that in mind. Um, that is going to eventually increase calcium levels in the blood, and we'll talk about calcitriol in just a minute. So it does enhance calcitriol synthesis, and then it inhibits collagen synthesis by the osteoblast, which in turn inhibits bone deposition. So it's going to slow down the building up of bone, increase the breaking down of bone so that we can increase calcium levels in the blood. So I just mentioned that parathyroid hormone has an effect on calcitriol. Parathyroid hormone actually promotes the formation of the hormone calcitriol, which is the active form of vitamin D. Calcitriol increases the rate of calcium, hydrogen phosphate, and magnesium absorption from food within the gastrointestinal tract into the blood. So this is going to increase our absorption of calcium, hydrogen phosphate, and magnesium from the food that we're eating and digesting in the GI tract and bring that into the blood. By increasing this absorption from the gastrointestinal tract to the blood, it is going to in turn increase calcium levels that are in the blood. So the blood calcium levels are actually going to directly control the secretion of both parathyroid hormone and calcitonin through negative feedback that we've talked about so many times. So when calcium levels are low, this is going to cause the parathyroid hormone to be released to help increase calcium levels by releasing parathyroid hormone, by releasing calcitriol, once calcium levels are back to normal, negative feedback is going to occur and parathyroid hormone and calcitriol will no longer be released. This also works similarly with calcium levels in the blood being too high and triggering the release of calcitonin. When calcitonin is released, it is going to work to lower blood calcium levels. Once blood calcium levels have returned to normal, negative feedback will kick on and calcitonin will stop being released and therefore blood calcium levels will remain stable. I hope that this video helped you to better understand the physiology that occurs within the skeletal system. I know that in anatomy and physiology, the physiology portion is always the most confusing because we talk about different processes, maybe some hormones, um, things like that, so it can be very confusing. I hope that I've presented this to you in a way that helps you to better understand what is going on. If you have any questions or comments, please make sure to drop them down below. Um, make sure that you also subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Click on the notification bell so that you never miss out on a new video. And uh, please share my channel with others that you think may benefit. Thank you.